Welcome everybody to the first day of the workshop, uh, Tropical Geometry and the Geometry of Linear Programming. We are delighted to have a great group of speakers from all over. So it's my great pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Daniel Dadouche, who's going to give us a panoramic lecture about probabilistic analysis of the simplex method and polytope diameters. All right. So uh, I want to thank the uh, organizers of this workshop for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, and also for giving one of the uh, organizers of the trimester program more work to do. Um, and uh, I'll be talking to you today about uh, probabilistic uh, analysis of the simplex method. Um, this is based on, on joint works with uh, sort of various people, uh, in particular, uh, my Sophie uh, my student, Sophie Halberts, who did uh, a lot of the, the work in the slides. I stole uh, many of the slides from, uh, from her talks. Um, and the, the subject of the talk is uh, going to be about sort of three different uh, simplex stories, I would say, um, that track uh, work of mine and my co-authors over, over the years. Um, and while a lot of it is, is a kind of maybe a, a slightly older work, I know that there are a lot of people uh, in the audience who are interested uh, in the simplex uh, method in, in our community, but maybe are slightly less comfortable or familiar with all the kind of probabilistic and geometric aspects. Um, so I thought I would try and put all of that together, maybe in one talk, uh, possibly somewhat ambitiously, uh, to give you a flavor of uh, how these arguments work. Um, so more specifically, uh, you know, we'll start off with uh, an intro to simplex, and in particular, the simplex method that we're going to use throughout the talk, which will be the so-called shadow vertex simplex method. Um, and then I'm going to move towards what you can say about uh, analyzing the simplex method on uh, arbitrary instances of LP that are slightly perturbed. Uh, and this is the so-called smooth analysis of simplex model that was introduced by Spielman and Tang. Uh, and then I'll switch over to the question of the, uh, bounding the diameter of polyhedra. Uh, and I'll um, talk about one example where um, you're, you're looking at, at polyhedra with very, very nice uh, constraint matrices, which are, uh, you can think of uh, uh, totally unimodular systems, uh, for example. Um, and then one uh, example, which is uh, for random polytopes, where I'll give you an asymptotic bound. Uh, so that's uh, a bound that, that works when the number of constraints uh, is very large uh, compared to dimension. All right, so that's, that's the plan. And then, of course, my slide thing stopped working. That's disappointing. Um, I don't know why it stopped working. Ah, whatever. Um, okay, so uh, our goal is to solve uh, linear programs and we're going to do so via the simplex method. So we want to uh, maximize a linear function subject to linear constraints. Um, and how the simplex method does this is that you uh, somehow start from a vertex of the feasible region, which is given to you um, in advance, or I mean, maybe you find a way to compute it. Uh, and then you uh, try and move from uh, vertex to vertex, uh, adjacent vertices, um, in such a way that you improve uh, the objective value at every step. Um, most of the time, you improve the objective value at every step. And you finally get to a point where you can no longer uh, locally improve anymore. There are no adjacent vertices to you that have better objective value. And then by standard LP theory, you know that you're done uh, and have solved the problem optimally. Um, so let me just mention three basic pivot rules that I think you know, everybody, everybody should know. Um, I'll only really uh, discuss the third one in detail over the course of the talk, but I think uh, everybody should know these, these three rules. Um, so all of the rules are uh, indexed by um, you know, what, what the situation is, is you start uh, from some vertex, which I managed to delete. Uh, you start from some vertex and you have uh, the tight uh, inequalities to that vertex, and we'll assume that uh, you have exactly dimensions in them, so you have no dimension. And then in that situation, you will also have uh, dimension many uh, 
um, edge directions that leave that vertex uh, that index the possible uh, edges uh, outgoing from that vertex. Um, and all of the rules will essentially normalize uh, these edge directions in different ways and then choose the one that has the largest, choose to move along the one that has the largest inner product uh, with the objective uh, C in this context. So uh, Danzig's rule, which is also the minimum reduced cost or maximum reduced gain rule uh, in, this, in this case, just normalizes the edge directions with respect to their slack, uh, with respect to the uh, opposite facet to them. So here, uh, W1, the opposite facet would be uh, this one. And so you normalize them to all have uh, slack one, and then subject to this, you pick uh, the one which maximizes uh, the objective. Uh, the steepest descent rule, uh, you just normalize so that all of the edge directions are unit vectors, and, and then you do the same thing. Uh, and the parametric objective or shadow vertex rule, um, I'll explain this more geometrically in, in the next slide. You essentially do the same thing, but you have uh, a reference uh, objective in mind that you use to do this uh, normalization. So for those of you who may be familiar with the successive shortest path algorithm for minimum cost flow, this is an example of a shadow vertex rule where uh, cost is the sort of objective you want to go for, uh, but flow is essentially the normalizing objective. Um, okay, so uh, the shadow vertex rule is what we're going to be uh, discussing for, for most of the, the, the talk. And uh, this rule has really beautiful geometry associated with it. I, I say, you know, four out of five geometers recommend it. Um, and what exactly is the geometry uh, that, that is associated that we can work with here? So um, when you're starting uh, a simplex path using this rule, you have to have uh, two objectives. Uh, the first one, which you see in, in the bottom here, is uh, an objective C prime. And that's an objective which maximizes your starting vertex. And then you have an objective C, which maximizes, you know, the, the, which is the objective which corresponds to the pro problem you want to solve, right? So in this case, you uh, essentially want to get here, right? And how do you follow a, a shadow path? Um, you essentially interpolate along uh, the straight line between the two objectives. Here I've drawn it curved, but it, it doesn't really matter how you interpolate. And as you interpolate, you follow the sequence of vertices um, that appear on the boundary um, of, the, of the polytope. And what is not obvious is that this sequence, in fact, in does induce uh, a normal simplex path that follows uh, edges and, and vertices. And the geometric interpretation here of like what's going on, you see in the plane on the bottom. So essentially, you take your polytope, you project it orthogonally onto the span of uh, both of your objectives. This gives you a two-dimensional polygon. The vertices of that polygon uh, lift up to vertices of your original polytope in a generic situation. And similarly, the edges also lift up to edges. So the boundary of that two-dimensional polygon, the so-called shadow, uh, indexes the path, and the length of the path is the number of edges in the projection. So this is uh, very, very useful from a geometric perspective to have uh, this kind of characterization. Uh, in particular for this rule, you know, determining whether a vertex shows up on the path is something that you can write down as a linear program itself. I mean, in general, if, you're, uh, if you have non-degeneracy, it's really uh, just solving a system of linear equations. You can, you can check this. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, why people use a simplex method and what kind of performance bounds are known. Um, so... The first thing that we should realize is that simplex is essentially the most popular method used to solve LPs today. Um, even though we have you know, polynomial, many different polynomial time alternatives and it's useful to ask why. Um, and there are three reasons I could give. So the first one is that in many situations you do want exact solutions, like when you're uh, generating cuts within a cutting plane method. Um, and simplex gives those to you directly. There's no need to do a rounding process uh, such as you would have with an interior point method. And usually that process can be just as expensive as uh, running simplex from scratch. Um, the second thing is that pivoting operations are usually very, very fast and can be done uh, effectively using uh, tricks from sparse linear algebra. 
so the, the iterations are, for example, much cheaper than uh, the corresponding iterations would be, say, of an interior point method. Uh, and the last thing, which is probably the most important one, uh, and also the least uh, studied from a theoretical perspective, is that the simplex method is very fast to re-optimize when you add constraints or change variable bounds. Uh, this is at least when you run uh, it on the dual problem. Uh, and this kind of warm start uh, capability is uh, really fundamental in the context of branch and bound, uh, where this is what you're doing the entire time, right? You're adding cuts, you're fixing variables, and you're solving many related linear problems. All right. So uh, one can now ask from a theoretical perspective, you know, we don't have polynomial bounds, but, but how bad can this method be? Um, and here uh, I have uh, an example. There are many, many now examples of lower bounds for sort of your favorite pivot rule. This is an example for uh, the shadow vertex method um, where um, a variant of the so-called Clementi cubes, um, this is the construction on the left uh, with the appropriately chosen shadow plane, you will get that every single vertex of the polytope appears on the shadow. Okay, so you get an exponential uh, bound. So, so here, these, these polytopes are combinatorially cubed, so they have exponentially many vertices um, on the number of vertices on, on the path. And this actually, uh, you can have fun trying to follow the path yourself to see that you will, in fact, traverse every single vertex. All right, so, so the question here or the criticism, I don't know, is maybe that you know, these are very contrived uh, examples uh, and, you know, do they, do, should we really expect them to appear in practice, uh, yes or no? And, and we'll try and answer that uh, question uh, throughout the talk. So um, I want to give just a, like a list of places where we in fact do know good things about the performance of the simplex method. I'm not going to list any bounds other than we have sort of polynomial bounds in the relevant parameters. Um, and these instances range from what I would call random, which uh, we're going to, uh, in particular, look at these smooth instances that I mentioned before, uh, where you can do things like choose the constraints at random from a nice distribution. Uh, uh, another uh, model has been to start from arbitrary data and flip uh, the signs of constraints. Um, the smooth instances introduced by Spielman and Teng, which I will get to. Um, and then you have, on the other hand, uh, a setting where you have sort of um, well-conditioned polyhedra, or also I haven't mentioned this uh, in, in this slide, but let's say more combinatorial polyhedra, uh, such as per the perfect matching polytope, where you know, we know so much about it that, that we can somehow make our simplex methods work. Um, but when you have a little bit less structure, uh, this is, I would say, a, a pretty good uh, representative list of places where, where we get uh, polynomial time simplex methods. So things like when you know that the, the ratio of uh, the minimum slack to maximum slack on any constraint uh, is bounded, uh, you get polynomial time methods. This is something that occurs in, in Markov decision processes with uh, bounded discount factors. Uh, when the vertices are nice, they all uh, have coefficients that are small integers. Uh, or, and this is the case that I'll, I'll also talk about, uh, is when you have bounded subdeterminants. So your, your constraint matrix uh, is, say, totally unimodular. Okay. So I'm going to now talk about um, uh, the sort of lead up to, to smooth analysis and where it came from and what it can do. Um, so I would say the story is first before, uh, you know, the smooth analysis setting where we had these average case analyses. And I, now I will give you the bounds uh, that, that uh, you, you get from these, these types of analyses. Uh, and so here, uh, the, the work that was really initiated by Borgwart in terms of uh, doing average case analysis in a really, um, you know, uh, amazing way, he showed that if you start from a setting where you have a polytope where the right-hand sides are one, so the polytope is feasible because zero is feasible, and you sample the rows of the constraint matrix uh, from an arbitrary rotationally symmetric distribution, um, then you can um, give a sort of shadow vertex based uh, algorithm uh, whose complexity is sort of cubic in uh, the dimension and very, very slowly growing in the number of constraints. Okay, so this is m to the power of one over m minus one. That's very, very slowly growing in the number of constraints. 
Uh, and for the random sign flip model, uh, they could show, uh, again, a sort of parametric simplex. It's not quite shadow simplex that gives you uh, um, um, quadratic dependence. Uh, and in the random sign flip model, one thing you should notice is that if uh, the number of constraints gets bigger than dimension, then very, very quickly the problems are infeasible. Okay. So we have these really nice average case results. Um, and you know, the next question is really, can we um, analyze these things in more realistic settings, right? I mean, generally one wouldn't say that flipping the signs of constraints is terribly realistic. And so uh, uh, another criticism is, you know, you, you, you have uh, completely random instances and what you might consider typical instances, and typical is, is very hard to define. So if you look at images, you know, the left-hand side would be a typical image you might find on the internet, uh, and the right-hand side is a completely random image, right? So they have nothing to do with each other. Um, and so Spielman and Tang gave uh, a sort of way to try and interpolate between these two uh, worlds. Uh, and the thought process is, you know, you start with perhaps a typical instance, uh, which is, you know, this basket in, visualized by this, this basket of mushrooms. Um, and then moving from that typical instance to an average case instance, what you do is you just add noise to it, okay? And you keep track of how much noise you add and you try and understand how the behavior of your algorithm changes as you add more and more noise, right? So this gives you a continuum between uh, the sort of worst case where the noise is zero and the average case where the noise is basically everything. Um, so uh, in the context of linear programming, how do you formalize this? Um, so it's more or less maybe what, what you would expect. Uh, you, you start with an arbitrary worst case instance. Um, so that's indexed by C, A bar, and B bar. Um, and for uh, the, the instance, you need to normalize it so that it makes sense to add noise to it. Um, so we normalize so that A bar and B bar, the rows of that have norm at most one. And then you add noise. Uh, you add independent uh, mean zero variance, sigma squared Gaussian noise uh, to each entry of A and B. Importantly here, we don't need to um, perturb the objective at all. So that's, that's nice. Uh, so only the constraint matrix in the right-hand side need to be perturbed. Uh, and the goal that we're going to go for is to show that for these perturbed instances, we can find a simplex method whose running time is expected polynomial time, where the polynomial is allowed to, of course, depend on the dimensions of the problem. Uh, and most importantly, it's allowed to depend uh, polynomially in one over the amount of noise, okay? So this one over sigma type of dependence, you should think of it as um, a sort of pseudo polynomial time uh, style of complexity. Like in the same as with knapsack, you depend uh, on the size of the numbers in unary. Uh, this is exactly the same type of phenomena here. Right. Um, so there are many reasons why you, know, you, 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 might, you might look at this. Um, it's a model that works. Uh, you can think of it from the perspective of measurement errors when you're building the instances. Um, and importantly, if you can show that, you know, a problem has small smooth polynomial complexity, uh, you kind of strongly show that, that the hard instances um, are a vanishingly small subset of all instances, at least under, you know, your perturbation model. So what kind of results uh, can, can you get here? So as I said, this was started by Spielman and Tang. Uh, and, you know, in a very complicated and long paper, they, they you know, were able to, to get some polynomial dependence out, uh, some smooth polynomial dependence out, but uh, you can see it was a bit of a nightmare. Um, and uh, Vershinen uh, found a way to uh, make the complexities much more reasonable uh, and also uh, was the first to get the dependence on the number of constraints to be polylogarithmic as opposed to polynomial. Uh, and, you know, Sophie and I managed to do, uh, you know, the same thing, but we simplified and improved uh, all the arguments. So what's the key uh, estimate or the key quantity behind all of these analyses? And unsurprisingly, it has to do with the size of shadows. Uh, so here by size, I'm thinking of uh, the number of vertices. And um, what we're looking at 
is we're looking at a smooth linear program. Um, yes? So there's some complexity or... Number of iterations. Yes, they, it's the number, of, the previous slide was the number of iterations. It's not accounting for uh, the um, uh, arithmetic complexity. Uh, well, I mean, if you're doing pivots, pivots are usually NM. So, I mean, in the worst case, so you would you would get that. Up. Yes. Yeah. So the question was the question was are the is the number of iterations sort of smaller than the size of the input? Uh, and to some extent, the answer is 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 yes. But of course, in each iteration, you do look at all of the rows. So so that I mean. Uh, but yes, the number of iterations is smaller than, than, than the dimension of a problem. Um, so is there a, a concept that there's something like, like, a, like a, a kind of a linear algebra that separation is a principle that you don't need to take out all the, all the uh, so, so Fritz asks, is there uh, something analogous to the, the fact that you know, when you solve things in the separation oracle model, you, you don't need direct access to all the inequalities. Actually, I think you know the answer to this question, Fritz. Uh, the, the, because, uh, I mean, to some extent, not, not in one algorithm, but I mean, Clarkson's algorithm, uh, which, which you, you know and love, I mean, to some extent does something like this, right? You kind of look at uh, only a quadratic number of inequalities at a time, uh, and... Oh yeah, you have to sample on the full set. Yeah, okay, that's true. That's true. Okay, that's true. Um, my answer is, I guess I don't know. I guess I don't know. Um, all right. So, so as I was mentioning, you know, uh, we're uh, very concerned with the size of of projections, two dimensional projections of our our smooth polytope, uh, and the setting where I just want you to notice is that uh, the right hand sides now are one. And only the left-hand side of the constraint matrix, only the constraint matrix is smooth. So we don't have an arbitrary right-hand side when we're trying to uh, compute the expected number of vertices that we see here, all right? So uh, this is the key estimate. Uh, and for this key estimate, um, we have corresponding bounds. Um, and at least if you look at you know, the last uh, row, you can see that um, the shadow bounds are exactly the same as the complexity for solving the LP up to some additive factor. Um, and that's really saying that you, our, our algorithm essentially only follows order one shadows um, of the type that was, were in the previous slide to solve an arbitrary LP, smooth LP. Um, now, the first two rows I want to point out are uh, Borgwart's bounds. So Borgwart really started this um, you know, game of trying to understand the size of uh, random shadows. And uh, he proved like tight results in almost every possible way. But in the context where, you know, the, you, you, you're not perturbing um, an instance, the instance is completely random. Uh, so you could already tell from Borgwartz's work that you should expect uh, in the second line when you're working with Gaussians, um, a polylogarithmic dependence on the number of constraints, but it took a while before we were able to do that in the smooth model, all right? And, and Vershinen did that. Uh, and as I mentioned, Sophie and I get the, the, the best bets. All right, so let's um, talk briefly about um, how you can actually solve an arbitrary smooth LP via uh, following the shadows where the uh, LPs have right-hand side one. Um, I think I'll just, sketch it very briefly uh, in the in the interest of time. Um, but again, the, the, the claim, and this is, this is a, a very simple algorithm. It, it doesn't achieve the sort of order one shadows uh, bound to solve the LP. It does N, so which is, which is much larger, but it's, it's quite simple. Um, so the idea is you want to take this LP where the right-hand side is not one, but, but B, and you want to reduce it to uh, following shadow paths on n different LPs with right-hand side one. Um, so how do you do this? And of course, when you do this, you have to maintain that they're still smoothed. All the instances that you see are still smooth. And very importantly, the shadows that you choose should be sort of independent of uh, the randomness 
And in fact, they will only depend on the uh, objective function. Um, so uh, briefly, you know, what do you do? The first thing you do is you actually solve uh, the uh, LP that you want to solve, but with right-hand side exactly one. Uh, and here you would think that you could use a shadow, one shadow to do this, but the issue is that you don't have a starting vertex, right? And you're not allowed to let the shadows depend on the instance, uh, and you don't have a starting vertex, so you kind of seem like you have a chicken and an egg problem. Um, but there's a very simple solution to this, which was given by Borgward. Uh, and this is simply to solve the LP by revealing one variable at a time. So you solve the LP with all variables uh, fixed to zero except for the first one. Uh, this is feasible because, you know, the right-hand side is a one, so zero is a solution. And also for all of this, assume that, you know, all LPs that we need are bounded and, and et cetera, et cetera, to avoid uh, technical discussions. Um, and then uh, the idea is that once I've uh, solved the problem for, you know, the first K variables uh, being revealed, um, I can solve the problem, the next problem, where I add one more variable into the mix by following one shadow, okay? Uh, and the, the main observation is that, you know, the optimal solution at time K uh, is basically going to optimize an objective at time K plus one, which is essentially the objective corresponding to the first K coordinates and something uh, undetermined, but uh, it will only be supported on the K plus one coordinate. And you can easily see this by just Lagrangifying out the constraint um, xk plus one equals zero. Um, and this uh, objective turns out to be on the shadow that I've defined at time k plus one. And of course, the objective that I want to maximize at time k plus one is also on the shadow, right? So that, that's basically it. You, you, you solve uh, n minus one different times. Um, here in the bottom, you see the illustration in two dimensions of, you know, you've solved the problem on the line, you're on, you know, the appropriate shadow uh, in the two-dimensional case, and uh, in fact, you're always in the middle of an edge, more or less. This x1, which is the solution at the end of step one, is always in the middle of an edge. So that's, that's more or less how to solve the uh, first uh, problem. And now you've solved the problem where the right-hand side is one, and you would like to move to where the right-hand side is b. Uh, and I won't say much about this, but you can just do this by uh, working in one higher dimension, where you add one extra variable, which exactly does this interpolation for you. Uh, and if you penalize the variable one way, so you, this variable uh, uh, lambda, if you penalize it very negatively, you're going to want to set it to zero. Uh, and that corresponds to um, a solution to the phase one LP. And if you penalize it to infinity, uh, which is actually not penalizing it, but it's uh, making you want to make lambda big, you're going to eventually set lambda equal to one, which will give you a solution to uh, the, the actual LP that you want. Um, and this just corresponds to uh, rotating on one shadow, which you see here. Um, so that's, that's all I wanted to say about that. Um, any questions so far? Clarifications about anything? Yes. So these smooth analysis results, that's always for this uh, a shadow simplex pivot rule, right? Yes. yes. Uh, is there, yes. or my question is, is there any work about like the more common uh, pivot rules that are used in practice and also seem to perform quite well? Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't think we know any smooth analysis of anything else other than a shadow vertex based rule. Um, I thought I saw Heiko here somewhere. No, maybe I didn't. Um, so th this is the only method that we know how to analyze in that way. Okay. Um, the chat is not working, so you can tell people to either unmute themselves or they can ask on Slack. Oh, oh. Uh, so I've just been told that the chat is not working. Um, so if people want to ask questions, you should uh, unmute yourself and ask the question uh, if you're watching online. Or, yeah. Or Oh, or you can write it on a, on the Slack, uh, which it doesn't matter which channel, uh, the, workshop. the workshop channel. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so now I want to uh, say a few 
you know, I want to show you an outline of what the, the smooth shadow bound looks like. So proving this uh, key geometric estimate. Um, and again, we start on the left where we have a smooth uh, linear program with right hand side one. We have a fixed plane. We want to count how many vertices there are uh, in the two dimensional projection. Uh, and the first thing we can do, and this is uh, by essentially simple polyhedral duality, is that this uh, number of vertices in the two dimensional projection of the polytope P is the same as the number of edges in the slice, the corresponding slice of the polar. Uh, so this is just polyhedral duality. Uh, here you see that there's a less than or equal to as opposed to an equality. This is uh, an equality whenever P is, is bounded, whenever P is a polytope. But when it's unbounded, uh, the number of edges on the right-hand side can actually be bigger. Uh, but we just want an upper bound, so that's OK. Um, so, so that's uh, actually the, the, the view, geometric view that we will take here. Um, and just to remind ourselves, you know, the type of bound that we're going for uh, is something like this uh, n squared square root log m uh, over sigma squared. Uh, and I'm reducing here to the setting where sigma is small, so you don't have any other random terms flying around. So uh, what does this look like to, to bound this? So the first idea is extremely simple. This uh, idea already is, is something that was used by uh, uh, Dan Spielman and John Kellner, but in, um, in a sort of different line of work than, than this type of smooth analysis. Uh, and the basic observation is that, you know, we're counting edges of a two-dimensional polygon. Um, so how can we upper bound this? Uh, so the, one of the simplest possible things you could do is, is upper bound this by, you know, the, the perimeter, so the total length of the uh, outside perimeter, divided by the minimum edge length, right? This is sort of a brain dead uh, bound, uh, and this is essentially the bound we will use. Um, but to use it, uh, we're going to try and put expectations in the right places, uh, in the easiest possible places. Uh, and of course, I have to make this form, right? So let's, let's do that. Let's make it formal. Um, so remember, we're counting uh, these edges of the slice of the convex hull uh, with respect to this 2D plane. So notice first that, you know, every edge is going to come from a facet, and the facet is just going to be a, a simplex with uh, n um, induced by the convex hull of exactly n inequalities. And you're going to uh, induce an, uh, an edge in red there if the simplex is a facet of the convex hull and it intersects the subspace. Those are the two conditions that you need uh, to know that a facet uh, or a particular simplex will induce uh, an edge. And of course, the choices of these uh, simplices are prescribed. It's all you know, n subsets of uh, the uh, m vertices. Um, so you can combinatorially enumerate over them. Um, and we can denote by EB the event that um, a specific simplex will in fact induce an edge, right? That's, that's the event. So now we can just uh, decompose the expected perimeter using linearity of expectation and Bayes rule, um, which is just going to tell us that we should just sum over all possible, you know, simplices, um, you know, the expected length of the edge you would get from it assuming that it would induce an edge, which is those two events that I mentioned before, times the probability that uh, it actually induces an edge. And from here, you're almost done. So what do we do? We just take out the minimum of the sort of conditional expected edge length. And what we have left over is uh, the sum of the probabilities that each of the simplex induces an edge. But this uh, last quantity has a name, and it's just the expected number of edges. Right, that's just by linearity of expectation again. Um, so now, uh, by by rearranging, we get the sort of following very nice formula uh, that the expected number of edges of the slice is upper bounded by uh, the expected perimeter divided by the minimum edge. Right. So um, let's try and analyze this a bit further. So if we start with the perimeter, um, this I can give you a bound in one slide. Um, and it's very simple. Uh, we'll, in fact, show that in our parameter setting, the expected perimeter is constant. Uh, and what do you do? 
So again, we're interested in the perimeter of a two-dimensional polygon. So if we're being pessimistic, we might as well replace that polygon by um, the, uh, any uh, circle that contains it, right? So the radius of the minimal circle that contains it is just the largest norm of any point inside the slice. Uh, and the perimeter would just be two pi, two pi r as we know from elementary geometry. And this, this upper bounds the perimeter of the polygon. And then the next step is to make our life easier, we replace uh, the, the slice by a projection. So we project onto the two-dimensional space instead of taking a slice. Uh, and this only makes the, the set bigger. So it only makes uh, the, the perimeter larger. Uh, and when you replace by a projection, what's nice is that the vertices of the projection are just the projected vertices from upstairs. So that's these pi i a i, the pi w a i's. Um, and the largest norm of, you know, any, anything inside that projection will be the largest norm of any individual projected vertex. Um, and you can use the triangle inequality to prove that that's bounded by a constant because the um, sort of means of these vertices all have norm at most one, that's, that's an assumption. Uh, plus sigma times square root log m, and that second term just comes from the fact that you're perturbing, uh, in this case, with two-dimensional Gaussians of standard deviation sigma. And so a standard computation will give you that second term. Uh, but since sigma is small, that second term uh, is not dominant. And so you just get a constant upper bound on the perimeter. So all the complexity really at the end of the day is bounding, lower bounding the minimum, the expected minimum edge length. And that's uh, far more, far trickier. Um, so I'm only going to show sort of a few pictures here. Um, so the first thing is, you know, we sort of take our favorite simplex uh, and we, we only ana analyze that. The first thing we'll do is we'll sort of condition on which hyperplane this simplex lands on. That's the, the, you have the two hyperplanes there. One is W, which is the slicing plane, and the other one is the hyperplane, which contains the simplex. So if you can condition on this hyperplane, it makes it very easy to condition on the event that the simplex will form a facet because all of the other AIs for it to form a facet either have to land on one or the other side of the hyperplane. Um, so it makes it very easy to deal with that kind of conditioning. And we're interested in the length of the red segment. And the, the only thing I want to show here is that, I mean, in terms of the, the style of analysis, is that uh, we break up lower bounding the length of the red segment into lower bounding sort of two roughly independent quantities. Uh, and the first one is sort of the height of the simplex in the direction of the line. So it's the sort of longest chord in the direction of the line, which is the blue uh, chord there. And the other one is sort of the ratio between uh, the length of uh, the chord induced by the red segment and the longest one. And you can see from these pictures that I'll, that I'll show you these animations that these two things kind of act a bit independently. So if I shift the simplex around, I can change uh, the ratio between the red chord length and the blue chord length. Um, and you can imagine that this shift is kind of random because everything is sort of random. And it turns out that this shift information is only using information sort of about shifts that are somewhat orthogonal to the line L. And then on the other hand, if I change the relative positions on the AIs in the direction of L, that's going to change the length of the blue line, but is not going to change the ratio between uh, the red and the blue. And so these two things essentially act uh, independently and you can analyze them independently. Uh, and you kind of get these, these, these bounds uh, that you, you, you see on the screen. Um, you multiply them together, you get the bound that I claim, uh, but I'm not gonna say sort of anything more than that. Okay. Yeah, I see, I have 10 minutes. <laughs> oh, no, no, I have, a, I have an hour, right? Yeah, you have 20 minutes. 20 minutes, okay. All right, were there any questions about that part? Okay, great. So now I'm going to switch gears and we're going to start talking about uh, diameter of polyhedra, um, where 
uh, what you're what you're trying to do when you're trying to bound the diameter or the diameter that we're interested in is the largest shortest path distance between any two vertices of your polytope, right? So you think of the the polytope or the the graph induced by the vertices and edges of the polytope as a regular graph, and you ask about uh, the diameter of that graph. Um, and the you know the question we want to know is how large can can the combinatorial this this diameter of the so-called one skeleton B. And uh, the famous uh, conjecture due to Hirsch in 1957 uh, is that if P is a polytope, i.e. is bounded, uh, then the diameter should be at most uh, M minus. And this was uh, disproven uh, recently, but, but not by much, and I'll say about by how much in a second. And so, you know, the, the kind of extended conjecture is just that the diameter should be bounded by some polynomial in uh, the number of uh, dimensions and the number of constraints. So what lower bounds do we have? Uh, we have lower bounds both for unbounded polyhedra and uh, polytopes. Um, the bounds for polytopes took a lot longer. Uh, but as you can see, I mean, we're off from what Hirsch conjectured by at most 25%, and for polytopes by 2%. So as far as we know, the Hirsch conjecture could be true up to a factor of two. Uh, our upper bounds are, are way worse. <laughs> And um, uh, already due to Barnett and Larman, we have bounds that are exponential in dimension, but linear in the number of constraints, uh, and also quasi-polynomial, uh, so due to Kalai and Kalai and Kleitman, as well, and refined by Todd and Sukagawa, uh, that are quasi-polynomial uh, in the number of constraints uh, and the dimension. Uh, and Fritz, uh, together with uh, Rosborough, uh, Thomas Hotfuss, uh, and Nikolai Hanley, showed that very similar bounds to these hold in a, in a much more general setting uh, known as connected layer families. And the proofs there are really, really nice and simple, and I, I highly recommend that people read the proofs from there. Um, so we have the same question as for simplex, which is, you know, when can we actually prove good diameter bounds that are reasonably polynomial? Uh, and uh, possibly, since we saw that, you know, in the in the smooth setting that you can get polylogarithmic uh, lengths um, in terms of the the lengths of uh, simplex paths, can we even find settings where you can get you know sublinear bounds? And so, you know, here there is a lot of classical sort of combinatorial work and even more recent combinatorial work that looks at you know our favorite. Uh, polytopes and combinatorial optimization and gets, you know, almost exact bounds uh, in many settings. So, so I'm not going to, to, to talk about this, but it's good for, you know, I just wanted to mention it. Um, but the setting that I want to look at is, is this uh, extension of the setting of, you know, totally unimodular systems. Uh, and here we have a polytope. It has an integer constraint matrix. Uh, and we assume that all the subdeterminants are uh, upper bounded by uh, some parameter delta. Okay. And in this setting, we do have a uh, very nice diameter bound. So already Dyer and Fries in the case of totally unimodular systems uh, essentially gave a, a simplex method uh, for the optimization problem that also by extension solves the, the, the diameter problem. And this was a, a random walk style simplex method. Uh, and then uh, Boniface, Marco Di Suma, Fritz, Nikolai, and Niemeyer um, uh, gave uh, an argument for general delta, which was really beautiful. Uh, they used a volume expansion argument uh, that was uh, non-constructive, so it, it didn't actually show you how to get the paths. Um, and then uh, Brunsch and, and Röglin showed how to make these uh, sort of slightly weaker bounds constructive using again our favorite shadow vertex simplex rule. Uh, and then uh, Nikolai Hanley and myself um, showed that actually with the right shadow vertex simplex rule, you can actually um, improve the existential bounds as well as make them constructive. So I will tell you a bit about that. Um, so what we're going to look at in fact is not going to really talk uh, at the end of the day about uh, diameter, um, uh, about determinant bounds at all, we're actually just going to look at a, a generalization in which, uh, which is implied by having uh, bounded subdeterminants. And this is a, a setting uh, that, I, that we call sort of tau-wide polyhedra. Uh, 
Um, so to define what this is, I have to define some objects. Uh, so the first thing is that, you know, let's start with our, our polytope uh, P. Um, and let's look at every vertex. Let's look at the set of all objective vectors that are maximized uh, at that vertex. So for V1, it's uh, this cone of objectives right here uh, is the set of all objectives that are maximized at V1, and that's called the normal cone uh, at V1. So every vertex has its own normal cone. And since we're uh, a polytope, I mean, for simplicity, we'll, we'll work with polytopes here. Um, you know, every uh, direction has uh, an optimizer. So this set of normal cones, in fact, forms a partition of all of our end. Right? And that partition uh, into normal cones is called the normal fan. So we're going to have a notion of width for the normal fan. Uh, and the notion of width is going to be that um, inside every normal cone, I can find a ball of radius uh, tau, okay? Uh, and to make this uh, reasonable, uh, I have to normalize where the centers of the balls lie. So I'm going to make them lie on the unit sphere. So there is, if your polytope is tau wide or the normal fan is tau wide, um, every uh, normal cone contains a ball of radius tau centered around the point of norm one, okay? So this is some notion essentially about the angles that the different constraints make with each other. Uh, and the claim, uh, which, which I'm not going to prove, is that if you have a subdeterminant upper bound, uh, then the normal cones are wide for uh, parameter one over n delta squared. Now, I'm actually not sure if this bound is tight. Uh, I, I would be curious if anybody could figure that out. Um, but it's mostly an exercise in Cauchy-Schwartz and Kramer's rule. So it's not anything particularly complicated. Um, but so for now, you know, if we want to prove diameter bounds, we might as well just think about uh, these wide polyhedra. And what bound do we, do we prove? Uh, we show that if your if you're, uh, polyhedron is tau wide, uh, then the diameter is bounded by uh, n over tau times log n over tau. Um, Oh, I would suspect that maybe, you know, that the, probably this bound can be somewhat improved, but I'm not sure by how much, because unfortunately this is not tight for, you know, even the cube, um, where, you know, the cube is, uh, it turns out to, to be tau wide for um, width one over root n. Um, but I can show that the proof, uh, in fact, gives the right answer for the cube. It's just that, uh, oh, <laughs> hi, Esper. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I see the chat now works. <laughs> Excellent. All right, so so let's uh, let's try and see how 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 you would prove uh, such a thing. Uh, now to to see this, uh, the first thing. So we're going to use the shadow vertex method. This is again no surprise, given that that's the theme of the talk. We want to view the shadow vertex simplex method in the perspective of the normal fan. Okay, and in this perspective, it's very nice. It's essentially we're going to look at uh, uh, a straight line in Rn and how many boundaries of the normal fan are crossed by this straight line, okay? And just to, to see, you know, what's happening here, you can look at this animation. You start, we're going to start from C and move towards D. And uh, every time you hit sort of the boundary of the normal fan that will correspond to an edge, uh, and you keep going, so that'll move you to the next vertex. Now you go through the next normal cone, you hit uh, a facet of the next normal cone that corresponds to the edge between, in this case, V2 and V3, and you continue until you're done, okay? Until there are no more intersections with the normal fan. So we've reduced the question, you know, of understanding the shadow vertex simplex method in this context to understanding the number of crossings a straight line has with the normal fan which maybe is, is, you know, it's, it's a useful geometric perspective. Okay. Um, so what kind of simplex paths do, do we use here or shadow simplex paths do we use here? The sort of main innovation is instead of going straight from C to D, let's add like a random intermediate objective. So uh, you, C and D would be the uh, objectives that optimize, let's say, the vertices you want to find small paths in between. And instead of going straight from C to D, we're going to go from C 
to some intermediate random objective X, and then from X to D. Uh, and in the proofs, our X is distributed according to this sort of Laplace uh, distribution with PDF e to the minus norm of X. And that, I mean, many things would work here, but that, that turns out to be nice. And so what's the main thing that we prove? That sort of immediately, uh, actually, this is the thing that we should have proved. Um, uh, this, this is true, uh, but it's not actually, you won't find it if you look in the paper. We, we had a slightly more complicated thing. Um, but okay, what is it that, that we should have proved? Uh, is the following, that if you uh, take any vertex and you take any objective that is sort of deep inside the normal cone of that vertex, so uh, it contains sort of a ball of radius alpha inside the normal cone of that vertex, then the sort of expected number of crossings that you get on the line from C to X is exactly upper bounded by uh, N over tau, tau is the width of the, the normal fan, times log N over alpha. And alpha is sort of how much space you have around you in the normal cone uh, of, of V. Uh, and sort of the alpha term, notice that that goes under a logarithm. So that's, that's nice. I mean, the hard, the annoying term is, is the tau that comes from the whole normal fan. Um, and if you have this, how do you prove the diameter bound that, that I claimed? Uh, it's essentially uh, sort of a two line application. I mean, you just wanna show that any two vertices have a short path in between them. Um, so, so start with those two vertices. Let's look at their normal cones. We know that the normal fan is tau wide. So I can pick vertice, I can pick objectives of, of norm one that have a ball of radius tau around them inside the, the corresponding normal cones. Um, and now let's just apply uh, uh, our anal the, the above theorem to analyze the length of the two-step path, right? So the two-step path will now, again, interpolate from C to X and then from X to D. Um, and we can analyze the lengths of those two paths independently, just using uh, linearity of expectation. And so it's just the sum of the uh, expected number of crossings on both paths. Uh, and that uh, gives you this n over tau log n over tau dependence. So there is a random distribution over paths that has you know, this length. And therefore, you know, uh, there is a path uh, that has this length. Um, and of course, you know, just by uh, Markov's inequality with probably a half, you, know, you, will, you will get two times this bound or something like that. All right, so how, what, you know, what does that look like? How do these proofs uh, work? Um, and uh, the, you know, it's actually, it's not particularly difficult. I mean, most of it is really kind of very basic calculus. Um, so the first thing to do is of course, write out the quantity that, that you're interested in. Uh, so you know, we have our normal fan, that's the partition into normal cones. Um, and uh, let's compute the expected number of crossings. So when we compute the expected number of crossings, we can sum sort of over all normal cones and then over all facets of every normal cone and ask, you know, what's the probability that uh, the segment crosses that facet, right? Uh, and because, you know, we're a polytope, every facet is counted twice. Uh, you know, the, like in the facet that I'm highlighting here, F, is counted for this normal cone and this normal cone. So everything is counted twice, so you have the one half. Um, and now uh, you use the fact that uh, F is a cone uh, or is a facet of cone and hence is also a cone um, to kind of rewrite this crossing event in a slightly simpler way, um, which is to say that the segment CX crosses F uh, sort of if and only if X lands inside um, F shifted by uh, any uh, negative scaling of the objective. Okay, so that's, uh, that's sort of just direct uh, by, by rearranging. Um, so we need to upper bound uh, the sum of all of these probabilities over all facets, right? So how are we going to do this? Um, the, the main thing that we're going to do is we're going to relate, you know, the crossing probability, I mean, the probability that F crosses a facet to the probability that X lands inside, uh, in fact, a, a specific chunk of the facet associated with the normal cone, right? Um, so why are we doing this? 
essentially uh, like, so, so let's just say I, I directly upper bounded uh, the probability, the crossing probability, which is on the left by some factor times the probability that X, let's just say lands inside the normal cone. Uh, this is kind of an optimization that maybe is not needed uh, for, for the sake of a first pass argument. Um, then notice that like if I sum over all po possible facets, um, assuming we're in a non-degenerate situation, I guess maybe that's why we need this optimization. Uh, in a non-degenerate situation, like every facet is, uh, uh, okay, so every normal cone has at most n facets. So we're going to count sort of every normal cone at most n times uh, if you sum over all possible facets here. Um, and, and that total sum will be n because, you know, the probability, number one, the normal cones yield a partition and the probability that uh, you land inside any part of Rn is one. Uh, and that's, that's sort of the idea. You're basically trying to relate the crossing probability to the probability of landing inside a piece of a partition. Okay, five minutes. Um, so uh, the, the partition that, that, that we choose is sort of indexed uh, for every facet and every normal cone, we're going to sort of associate the crossing area uh, with the, the part of the normal cone that is uh, corresponds to sort of F, but shifted by uh, a positive scaling of the center of the normal cone. Um, and the different terms that you see here, you have this like N over tau, that's sort of a surface area to volume ratio type of thing. I mean, maybe you can sort of imagine that uh, the surface area of F is kind of smaller than N over tau times the measure of that part of the cone. And it's sort of clear that, you know, as the cone gets less and less wide, this, this will get worse. Uh, and the log N over alpha relates to sort of how far you have to go before you land inside C's normal cone. Um, and so once you have that, as I said, you can sort of sum all of these bounds and you're summing over a partition. So this, these quantities are, are, are really partitioning uh, the space. I mean, these F plus, I mean, these parts of cones are, are partitioning space. And so this whole right-hand side just sums to one, all right? So that's, that's the whole bound. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I just want to mention the last results, uh, but I won't say much more about it, um, which is the, the last setting I wanted to mention very quickly, which is about the, the asymptotic diameter of random polytopes. Um, and here the model that, that we look at is exactly the model that Borgwart uh, studied. So you have um, uh, AX less than or equal to one where the rows of A uh, are sampled, in this case, uniformly from the sphere, okay? Um, and Borgward essentially showed that, you know, the, the shadows of these, uh, the two-dimensional shadows of these uh, uh, polytopes um, are very small. They have size, sort of the number of edges or vertices is size N squared times M to the one over N minus one. And if you think about it, what this essentially says is that you have this polytope. Um, if I sample two vertices of this polytope, and how do I sample? I sample by first picking, let's say, two random objective vectors, looking at the vertices that are um, maximized by those objectives, and then looking at the path in between them. And the shadow bound exactly tells you that the path in between those two objectives will have size at most the shadow bound. So if I take an average pair of vertices where the way I sample them is by sampling um, maximizers of random objectives, then I have short paths in between. And the only question to get a diameter bound is whether you can go from this like most pairs of vertices have short paths to all pairs of vertices have short paths. And that's, that's essentially what we were kind of able to show uh, when the number of constraints is sufficiently large. Um, so when the number of constraints is sufficiently large, we get sort of Borgward's bound plus an exponential uh, that only depends on it. Um, and we also have an almost matching lower bound in the asymptotic regime uh, that's off by one factor of dimension. It's, it's not quite tight, but, but we're pretty happy with it. All right, so let me uh, conclude. Um, so there, uh, I, I hope I showed you kind of different ways that you can analyze the, the shadow vertex simplex method that, that are useful. 
uh, as was maybe already noted by Stefan, like, you know, these analyses only apply to one method uh, and they're not really the methods that are used in practice. And there are lots of open problems, right? You can improve any of the bounds. Uh, you know, can you make smooth analysis even work with different noise distributions uh, other than Gaussian? Um, can we say something about why the simplex method sort of really shines, which is, you know, it's about solving many LPs that are all close to each other rather than solving one LP. Uh, and the, the last question, maybe I'll, I'll say uh, more about this in the discussion session, uh, is whether you can sort of combinatorialize the, um, the analysis of interior point methods to give, you know, things like two to the n bounds on the number of iterations for an interior point method to solve an LP exactly. Um, all right, so that's that's it. I also have a postdoc position. <laughs> uh, you can read more about it, uh, but that's it. So thank you very much.